Right, good morning, everyone. Um, um, welcome to the session. So Alison and I, we're both partners in the employment team, and we're going to look at six cases today um, dealing with various aspects, um, primarily of discrimination. So I'm going to look at cases um, dealing with disciplinary procedure and disability discrimination, marital status discrimination, and um, a, sex, a direct sex discrimination claim. And Al's going to be looking at um, redundancy age discrimination and pensions without prejudice negotiations and ill health termination and flexible work and sex discrimination. Next slide, please, Ellie. Um, before we go into the cases, we thought it was worth having a very brief reminder of some of the principles we're going to be looking at. So the first thing is a reminder of the protected characteristics under the Equality Act. So there are nine of these and the cases we're looking at today deal with age, disability, marriage and civil um, partnership and sex um, and the other protected characteristics are on the slide for information. In addition, it's worth just reminding ourselves of the framework of the discrimination regime. So um, as you all know, I'm sure employees can be discriminated against directly, indirectly, um, they're protected against being harassed and they're protected against being victimized. And in addition, addition there's specific protection relating to disability um, with some specific additional protections against discrimination arising from disability, which is a, a wider test and also some positive obligations to make reasonable adjustments for um, individuals suffering from a disability. So as Ali said, we'll have questions at the end, um, hopefully, so please put those in the chat and they can be either on anything we say or any aspects of discrimination. <clears throat> Over to Al for the first case. Al, you're on mute. I literally just said, although you wouldn't have heard me because I was on, on mute, I've managed to unmute myself, but evidently not. Um, apologies. Um, thank you, Cathy. I am looking at the first case, which is um, a case which considers um, redundancy, age discrimination and um, the pension um, implications of redundancy where uh, and employees a member of uh, the local government pension scheme so for those of you who are on this um, webinar um, having looked at the delegate list um, earlier some of you will be more familiar with the um, terms of um, LGPS than others and whilst this is a public sector pension scheme um, you can see from the case name um, again to group limited um, its applicability or, or some of its employees were obviously members of LGPS and that may be because of some outsourcing or contracting out of some public services but um, I'm not going to consider that in too much detail we're just going to look at what the case um, considered so um, this is a case which involved the potential redundancy of an individual and Mr Cook um, and his redundancy took effect um, prior to his 55th birthday. Um, and the reason why that uh, birthday was, um, was relevant or, or was of significance is because under the terms of the local government pension scheme, in circumstances where you have reached the age of 55 or over and you're made uh, redundant or your uh, employment is terminated on the grounds of business efficiency, which is one of the requirements under the LGPS regs, then you are entitled to um, your uh, payment of retirement pension without actuarial reduction, which is obviously a significant benefit to an individual, but from the perspective of the employer is also uh, a significant cost. So obviously this was in the minds, arguably, of the employer and having commenced the redundancy procedure, um, they curtailed it, they made it a shorter process than arguably it would have been, meaning that his redundancy took effect before he turned uh, 55. Um, essentially what happened was they, they had an initial consultation at the beginning of May 2019. Uh, Mr Cook went off sick and didn't attend any of the subsequent consultation meetings and was uh, dismissed on the 16th of May. So by anyone's um, assessment that is a quick consultation process 
for a redundancy. Um, has the redundancy not been curtailed, then Mr. C Mr. Cook argued that his uh, redundancy would have taken effect after his 55th birthday. And in those circumstances, the employer would have been, a would have been obliged to have made an £80,000 contribution into the pension scheme um, to essentially uh, ensure that those additional pension costs were covered, and that's known as a, a pension strain cost. So Mr Cook claimed that he'd been unfairly dismissed and that the curtailment of the process, the, the shortening of the redundancy process, um, amounted to direct age discrimination. So this uh, case was... Um, uh, considered by an employment tribunal um, and the tribunal agreed that Mr Cook had been unfairly dismissed. It found that the speed of the redundancy consultation procedure was unfair and that there hadn't been a, any real attempt or opportunity to look for suitable alternative employment, which is one of the requirements in a redundancy situation that you consider. Is there any other way that we can avoid this redundancy? Is there any other role? that objectively is suitable for the individual. Um, the tribunal also found that if the employer had run a fair process, Mr Cook would have still been made redundant, but that this would have taken effect after his 55th birthday. So meaning that he should have been entitled to his um, retirement benefits. Um, the tribunal, however, dismissed his claim that the, the shortening of the redundancy procedure was direct age discrimination. And um, in direct uh, discrimination claims, you're required to identify a comparator. And Mr. Cook, so somebody who um, was um, not 55 or not older, should I say, uh, and, and consider what treatment they were afforded, and um, so they said that he hadn't find, hadn't identified an, uh, a comparator and that in any event, it would have found any age discrimination to be justified as a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So just going back to the protected characteristics um, slide uh, that Cathy um, uh, talked to earlier, in cases of direct discrimination, you... Um, uh, you can justify it where uh, you um, say that, that where you can find that there is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And in this case, they said that there wasn't. So Mr. Cook appealed to the EAT, the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and they upheld his appeal. And they considered that the tribunal hadn't, sorry, the tribunal had not considered um, why the detrimental treatment was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate way aim. What was it about what they had done that was proportionate in the circumstances? Um, they said that the tribunal had an opportunity to explain its reasoning before the EAT reached its decision. Um, at that stage, the tribunal identified the employer's aim as being to save the costs that would have been incurred by paying into the pension. It also said the detriment caused to Mr Cook would have been proportionate in light of other payments he had received, such as his redundancy pay and his notice pay, which amounted to £47,000. The EAT wasn't convinced by this um, and um, has remitted the claim back to a newly constituted tribunal for reconsideration. So of course it is possible that when it goes back to the tribunal to, to be looked at again, um, that the tribunal um, may well uphold the original decision in circumstances where they can say they can provide better evidence or more detailed evidence about the proportionality um, issues. So if we could move on to the next slide. So as I said at the beginning of this section, whilst this is a public sector uh, pension scheme, LGPS, it does act as a reminder uh, to consider what other implications there may be when you're thinking about restructuring or looking at um, a, a, a reorganisation which may involve redundancy. Um, direct discrimin age discrimination is the only type of discrimination that can potentially be justified, um, so you need to think about that. Um, and interestingly, in this case, the tribunal thought of the enhanced pension as a windfall, but it did fail to balance the proportionality of the discriminatory effect against the uh, legitimate aim of saving costs. So uh, an interesting one for those of you who perhaps um, do have um, responsibility for um, 
uh, or, or are in a public sector pension schemes or these sorts of benefits may be on the horizon just to think through and plan um, how you're going to do it in case there are any issues that sort of come up and um, surprise you part way through the process. Cathy, I think you're looking at the next one. Yes, thank you, Al. So the next case is McQueen against the General Optical Council. And this is a case that looks at where somebody with a disability was subject to disciplinary um, proceedings um, because of their poor behaviour. So Mr McQueen, the claimant in this case, had various disabilities. Um, these included some symptoms of Asperger syndrome, he had some um, left-sided hearing loss and some dyslexia. And his employer, the General Optical Council, knew about these disabilities and they accepted that they were disabilities. And they sought over a number of years to support him at work. However, over a period of several years, Mr. McQueen had various difficult interactions at work. So he firstly had a meltdown um, in which he challenged an instruction from a senior colleague in a rude and aggressive manner. And he also made some aggressive gestures. And following that incident, he was referred to occupational health. And they looked at what reasonable adjustments could be made to support him in the workplace and to avoid these sorts of incidents um, occurring again. So after that occupational health referral and considering the advice given, um, it was concluded that if he was being asked to change the way he did something, he should be given those instructions um, in writing. Um, so he was sent those by email. However, notwithstanding the changes that were made, there were further confrontations with the same line manager and also with other colleagues. And um, his employer also challenged him about a habit he had of standing up at his desk and speaking very loudly at colleagues. Um, and this was considered to be disruptive to the work environment. So over time, he was disciplined on more than one occasion in relation specifically to his confrontational interactions with his colleagues. And there was then um, protracted grievance processes and eventually he brought two employment tribunal claims. And one of these was a claim for discrimination arising from disability under the Equality Act. And he argued um, in support of his claim that all of his disruptive workplace behaviour was attributable to his disabilities. The General Optical Council's position um, was that they acknowledged that there were known effects of his conditions um, and they had set some support in place um, in respect of those. And that included the um, providing the instructions in writing in relation to um, some instructions and also they'd made some physical adjustments to the workplace um, to support him. However, they did argue that his habit of standing up to talk and the way he interacted with his colleagues in certain situations did not arise as a consequence of his abilities, it was just a poor behaviour trait. So a brief look at the law, we, I said at the beginning that discrimination arising from disability, which is section 15 claim, was a special type of claim that only um, relates to the protected characteristic of disability. And in order to succeed in a claim, an employee needs to show that they were treated unfavourably because, some, of, because of something arising in consequence of their disability, and that something cannot be objectively justified. So over time, there have been many cases on these, and we've talked about some of the previous cases uh, in these sessions. Um, but generally, this has been interpreted quite widely. So the consequence of a disability encompasses a wide variety of factors and behaviours. However, on this occasion, the tribunal rejected a Mr McQueen's claim. They um, reviewed all of the medical evidence that they've been provided with and concluded um, that the way that Mr McQueen did interact with his colleagues was not something that arose because of his disabilities. So Mr McQueen, in, in line with his previous grievances, um, did not accept this and appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. And the EAT on this occasion upheld the tribunal's decision. They concluded that what, what Mr McQueen called a need to stand up in order to talk was actually a matter of habit. 
and in respect of the way that Mr McQueen would respond to colleagues when being given certain instructions, they concluded that he actually just had a short temper and that his disabilities had no effect on his conduct um, during the incidents in question. So therefore the General Optical Council, despite the fact that they had obviously taken formal disciplinary action against Mr McQueen, had not treated him unfavorably because of something arising in a consequence of his disability. Next slide, please, Ellie. Um, so where there's conduct um, issue arise relating to an employee with a disability, I suppose the positive point is that you can on occasion take disciplinary action against them. And some of the previous cases seem to almost you know, suggest that you put somebody with a disability in a box and, you know, you can't touch them. Well, that's not the case. You are expect, you are entitled as an employer to um, have um, a, an adequate and sensible contribution from all your employees, whether they have a disability or not. You just need to provide them with the support in order to make that contribution. Obviously, if you are um, disciplinary, disciplining somebody with um, a disability, you do need to take care to ensure that it's a fair and non-discriminatory process. And that might mean that you need to make um, reasonable adjustments to the disciplinary process itself. Um, however, you can proceed. And um, if you are proceeding against somebody with a disability, in almost all cases, you should be seeking medical advice on the employee's condition and how you can support them to perform their role, but also any definite and potential link with their conduct. And when you seek that medical advice, you need to ensure that you ask the right questions to ensure you obtain that more detailed information. And I, I know that occupational health providers are not always brilliant at, at sort of being forthcoming and, and, and giving helpful guidance, but the more detailed your questions are, more specific your questions are, the more likely you are to um, get some information that is helpful to you in differentiating between um, behaviours and conduct which does link to the disability and actually that which is just poor behaviour that is unacceptable and isn't necessarily linked to the disability. So broad generic questions are unlikely to be sufficient. And throughout both the employment tribunal decision in this case and the EAT decision, um, there was lots of reference to the detail of the um, uh, occupational health advice. And that was what um, enabled the employer in this instance to succeed in defending the claim. Over to you, Al. Lovely, thanks, Cathy. Um, I'm gonna be looking at a case now which involves um, without prejudice communications and um, circumstances around an ill health termination. So this is a case uh, involving um, a Mr. Meeker and he worked for, um, I wanna say six tier technology. It's probably, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. So I'll just call it the company. So um, Mr. Meeker had been off sick for an extended period of time, and wasn't able to um, return to his duties. So there'd obviously been some discussions in the background and the company um, indicated to Mr. Meeker that it was thinking about terminating his employment and entering into a settlement um, agreement with him. Uh, not unusual in these sorts of um, situ situations. It seems that there was a um, confusion around the, what was going on with these discussions but Mr Meeker was under the impression that these discussions would carry on um, but uh, the company uh, wrote to him on the 5th of February 2020 and that letter was marked without prejudice and they enclosed a draft settlement agreement within that uh, letter. The letter referred to the fact that there was a mutual agreement to terminate Mr Meeker's employment um, and that the, they would they confirmed that the termination um, date would be the 7th of February. It also set out what his holiday pay would be and what his notice provisions would be and that he would be sent his P45. The letter then went on to say that he would be entitled to a further payment which would be conditional upon Mr. Mika entering into the attached or enclosed settlement agreement, but he didn't enter into that agreement. So on the 14th of February, 
Mr. Meeker received his notice and holiday pay uh, and his employment was brought to an end. Mr. Meeker brought an unfair dismissal claim um, and a preliminary argument arose as to whether or not he had brought his claim in time. Um, so an employment tribunal must be brought with it, um, an employment tribunal claim, sorry, must be brought within three months um, of the effective date of termination uh, with an allowance for any time spent in the ACAS early conciliation uh, period. The uh, EDT, the effective date of termination, was really important in this case. And if the EDT was, as was stated in the letter, the 7th of February, then his claim would be out of time. Alternatively, if the EDT was the 14th of February, the date on which he received his notice pay and his holiday pay, the claim would be in time uh, and the issue of fairness or otherwise uh, could proceed. The tribunal found that the letter was, was essentially a letter terminating his employment and that Mr Meeker's uh, claim was out of time and they relied on the date of termination as set out in the letter. Mr Meeker appealed uh, to the EAT on that point. And they considered, the EAT considered um, the letter and considered what was in the letter. And they said that the employment, uh, sorry, the effective date of termination was the date of the summary dismissal, even where the dismissal was essentially a breach of contract or could have been statutorily unfair. It was not necessary for Mr. Meeker to accept the breach in order for the termination to be effective. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of what was said in the letter, how it was said in the letter, and I suppose the without prejudice um, marking of that letter, the, the EAT said it's construction. So what the letter actually meant and what it actually said was a matter for the tribunal to, to consider and to um, interpret. Uh, and it said that, um, that decision from the EAT's perspective could only be overturned if it was perverse. So whilst the letter wrongly referred to a mutual agreement because there wasn't a mutual agreement, um, that didn't matter um, because it didn't, that by itself didn't undermine the clear and unambiguous wording of the letter that your employment or Mr Meeker's employment would be terminated on that date. So the letter confirmed um, and the letter confirmed that quite clearly. Now, um, in terms of um, um, in terms of um, what the lessons learned from that, I think I've gone ahead without moving on the slide. Sorry, Ellie. And um, if we could move on, um, I've just uh, gone through all of those. That thank you onto the learning points. It, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I. I think as advisors, and I'm sure you as um, uh, practitioners, you'll be well used to having without prejudice conversations with employers, employees and their representatives. Um, and I think if nothing else, what this, um, what this case does is provide with a reminder as to just be quite clear about what you're writing in open communication, i.e your employment is going to terminate with effect from this date because of, um, in this case, capability because of ongoing ill health. And a without prejudice letter, which seeks to uh, um, agree a, a another approach, a, a settlement. And this approach was muddled in the sense that it was all under the banner of without prejudice. So there was always going to be some uncertainty um, as, as to what is off the record and what is what is open correspondence. So an interesting case, I think. Um, and uh, as I said, just a reminder really to make your um, communications really clear and, and straightforward. Cathy, you're going to look at a case on marital status. I am indeed, and, and this is unusual. There aren't many cases on marital um, status discrimination. And as we go through the case, we'll perhaps understand why. So in this case, um, Ms. Bacon um, started working for a company called Advanced Fire Solutions Limited, AFS, back in 2005. 
and a bit of a Cinderella story, she later married AFS's um, managing director and majority shareholder, Mr. Bacon, and she became um, a minority shareholder in the business and everything went on fine. Um, and then in 2017, um, Mr. Bacon replaced um, himself as managing director by a Mr. Ellis. So he remained as the majority shareholder in the business, but Mr. Ellis um, became responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the business. But following this, um, Ms. Bacon and Mr. Bacon um, subsequently divorced and um, clearly quite an acrimonious divorce. And Ms. Bacon during um, this time was falsely accused of misusing company IT equipment. She was suspended. She was removed as a director. She was not paid out share dividends to which she argued she was entitled as a minority shareholder and a baseless complaint was made about her to the police. And ultimately, um, Mr. Ellis dismissed Ms. Bacon in June of 2018. And the claim she brought in the Employment Tribunal was a claim for direct discrimination on the grounds of her marital status. And she alleged that she had been unfairly treated by Mr. Ellis because of her marriage to Mr. Bacon. And on the face of it, that seems like um, a reasonable supposition. So what's the test for direct discrimination on the grounds of marital status? So marriage and civil partnership, as well as the protected characteristic under the Equality Act, as we said at the beginning. And um, this was a claim for direct discrimination under section 13 of the Act, um, which um, says that you discriminate against another person if because of a protected characteristic, they treat that person less favorably than they treat or would treat others. So the Employment Tribunal held that Mr. Ellis had sided with Mr. Bacon in relation to the marital dispute and was acting at Mr. Bacon's behest by removing her directorship, by not paying Ms. Bacon her dividends, by ignoring a grievance she had raised and by reporting her to the police and then ultimately suspending and dismissing her on spurious grounds. So they upheld a claim for direct marital discrimination. Uh, Mr. Ellis appealed to the EAT. He said that wasn't the right decision. And he appealed on two grounds. He said that firstly, the ET had not reached the right decision uh, about the cause of the treatment. And that secondly, they had not compared her with the right comparator. They should have compared her with a non-married comparator. So somebody who was in a relationship with Mr. Bacon, but was not married to him. And the EAT very reluctantly allowed Mr. Ellis's appeal. They said and acknowledged that Ms. Um, Bacon had been treated very badly by Mr. Ellis, but the legal test had not been applied correctly. So the correct question that should have been asked and considered by the Employment Tribunal was whether Ms. Bacon had been treated less favorably by Mr. Ellis because of her marital status, rather than because she was married to a particular person. The, the tribunal hadn't asked this question and they would not considered whether Mr. Ellis would have acted in the same way towards somebody who was in a close relationship with Mr. Bacon, but not in fact married to him. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Ellie. <clears throat> so in this case, Miss Bacon was undoubtedly treated very badly and unfairly, but the decision is not a license to treat an employee badly in these circumstances. Um, and there may, of course, have been other claims that Miss Bacon could have brought and perhaps did. Um, it does, however, demonstrate that there is a very limited scope in the concept of marital status discrimination. The bare fact that an employee is married is not sufficient uh, in itself to show marital status discrimination. And the relevant question is whether an unmarried woman in otherwise the same circumstances, including in this case, being in a relationship with the managing director would have been treated any differently. So the protection will apply to those who are treated unfavorably because of either their marital status or their civil partnership. However, it doesn't operate to protect individuals who are treated unfavorably because of their marriage to a particular person. 
and a bit of a digression, um, why have we got marriage protection um, in, in the Act? So it, it was first introduced in 1975 in the Sex Discrimination Act. So, and at that time there was the so-called marriage bar was still in place. So women were, you know, often dismissed because they got married or were not allowed, married women were, were barred from applying for certain jobs. So I think it's really the historical basis of, of why we still have this protection that perhaps explains a little why the protection is so narrow. Thank you, Al. Thanks for that, Cathy. Can't imagine that now, can you? Those sorts of uh, rules and uh, how the Sex Discrimination Act um, has evolved. Um, I'm going to look at now a um, case on flexible working and um, and a flexible working request. It's it's an interesting case because um, you don't often get somebody appeal a decision um, to this extent. So it sort of looks at um, uh, flexible working in a bit in a bit more detail. Um, so this involved it, um, a store manager employed by Lacoste UK, and she was a, an assistant store manager. She worked, um, as you would expect, in a retail space. She worked flexibly um, over a five day uh, working week on, uh, and uh, that flexibility was according to how the work rotor was worked out within the store. Um, Miss uh, Glover went on maternity leave and during her maternity leave, which is often the way um, she uh, made a flexible working request, um, and she asked to work three set days a week. And um, presumably she did that in order to um, uh, give her the flexibility that she needed around her childcare commitments, but also um, the three set days a week so that she could sort out childcare. Um, the company turned it down. Lacoste said, no, uh, we can't do that. And Miss um, Miss uh, Glover uh, appealed. And Lacoste said, um, uh, you can't, uh, we've considered your appeal. But what we can agree to is you working part time across four days of the week in accordance to how the rotor is set. Um, and again, these four days as she'd been working to before would be on a fully flexible basis. So she could be required to work any day of the week, including weekends. And Ms. Glover said, well, uh, that's going to be impossible um, because how on earth am I going to arrange childcare when I don't know, you know, it could be different every week, um, what, what the requirements are. So it's just not workable. So this coincided with um, COVID and lockdown and um, Miss Glover was furloughed at the end of her maternity leave. So whilst she wasn't at work, um, she um, instructed solicitors and they negotiated a return to work on the basis of her original request, which was three days a week. Um, and that was all, all agreed. So she didn't actually ever have to work the four day fully flexible working pattern um, that um, Lacoste had put to her um, as part of her um, appeal. So notwithstanding the fact that it had all been agreed that she'd go back three days, which is what she wanted, she then lodged tribunal proceedings, which included a claim for indirect sex discrimination. And I think it's always useful just to remind yourself that even, um, even where you... Um, meet the requirements of the flexible working regime, the requests and the, the, rash, the reasons for um, not agreeing to a flexible working request, there is still a possibility, isn't there, that um, an individual could bring a claim for um, indirect sex discrimination. Um, so when the tribunal considered this, they dismissed Ms Glover's claim and said that well, on the basis that the company Lacoste had not in practice ever required her to work on a fully flexible basis, she hadn't suffered any disadvantage, there hadn't been a detriment. Um, and so um, Miss Glover wasn't happy with that. And so she appealed um, successfully, as it turned out, to the EAT. And the EAT held that the flexible working appeal outcome did count as a PCP, a provision, criterion or practice 
for the purposes of indirect discrimination. And they said it didn't matter that Miss Glover hadn't ever actually worked under that fully flexible arrangement, um, which was um, suggested um, as part of the appeal process under the flexible working request. Um, um, there was still um, there was still a, a, a detriment there. So having established that the appeal outcome was a PCP, the EAT has remitted the claim back to a new tribunal to consider whether Ms Glover suffered disadvantage or detriment as a result of the appeal outcome. And remitting the claim, the EAT has commented that it would be hard to see, and this is, this is a good bit of a direction from the EAT here, it's hard to see how the appeal outcome would not have caused Ms Glover to suffer disadvantage or detriment, given, given that she had to consider resigning from her job. So it will be interesting if, if it's not settled before and it does go back to the ET, it would be interesting to see what level of compensation she is going to get given its limited um, effect, I, I would suggest. If you just go on to the next slide, Ellie, thank you. So I've just put some reminders there, really. It's possible to comply with the statutory flexible work framework, um, but still face a claim for sex discrimination. It's really important to consider discrimina discrimination risks and how they can be uh, mitigated. And make sure that you fully explain what your rationale is. So you're almost sort of setting yourself a bit of a trail should um, these decisions be challenged. Um, and a reminder that even where you even where an employee successfully appeals, it may not necessarily cure any disadvantage detriment suffered by the employee at the time of the initial rejection. Um, and uh, the fact that a decision was reversed on appeal could obviously limit any injury to feelings type compensation. Um, so an interesting an interesting case. You don't often get flexible working requests be considered certainly at EAT level so um, a qu quite a nice um, summary and I suppose warning really around um, around the the application of uh, sex discrimination in these situations so Cathy I think you're looking at the next one yeah, so the last case um, we're going to look at is a direct sex discrimination, um, the case of Earl Shilton Town Council um, against Miller. And um, this um, case uh, relates to some toilet facilities. So um, Earl Shilton Town Council um, operated, um, small council, they operated from a church building. And in the same building, a local play group was also operating. And the women's toilets were in a part of the building that was in use by the playgroup. Um, and this meant that the, the, the female staff of Earl Shilton Town Council had to share the facilities with the playgroup staff and more importantly with the children. And what that meant was that um, they weren't allowed to go unaccompanied into the facilities, but they had to attract the attention of a playgroup member of staff in order to, to have access. So this is obviously not very satisfactory. So as an alternative, the respondent, um, uh, the council offered um, their female staff access to the men's toilets. Um, but this was also not very satisfactory um, because female staff needed to walk past the urinals in order to enter the cubicles and male colleagues had um, access to the male toilets at any time, as you'd expect. So there was no real privacy. And lastly, Miss Miller was very unhappy with the facilities because the, no sanitary bins were provided. So Miss um, Miller complained about these arrangements and she argued it constituted something she called inherent direct sex discrimination. And by, by that she meant that there was a difference in the way men and women were treated in respect of the provision of toilet facilities that were sufficient for their needs. So we've already looked at a few cases of direct discrimination. We know that you need, if you're going to succeed in your claim, to show that you've been treated less favourably than somebody else, a comparator, because of um, your protected characteristic, in this case, because of, of Ms Miller's sex. So the tribunal upheld the claimant's claim. They said, yes, um, men and women were treated differently um, in respect provision of toilet facilities because 
women's toilet facilities were not sufficient for their needs, but the male toilet facilities were. Um, the respondent appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal um, on two grounds. Um, firstly, they said that um, the causation test wasn't made out. You know, it wasn't because of Ms. Miller's sex that um, she wasn't given um, adequate toilet facilities. Um, the reason for the failure was because there were safeguarding reasons for the arrangements because the children um, had to be um, accompanied at all times and he couldn't have um, unaccompanied access by the council staff. So the reason for the treatment therefore could not be the claimant's sex. And in respect of um, women using the men's toilets, um, they said that there was no less favourable treatment looking at men as a comparator because men and women were treated equally. They were at equal risk of seeing each other in the toilets. Um, the Employment Appeal Tribunal dismissed the appeal. They said that the basic position was that the respondent did not provide the claimant with toilet facilities that met her needs. And this was less favourable treatment um, compared to the treatment of her male colleagues who had toilet facilities that did meet their needs. And as a result of the treatment, the claimant had suffered a detriment. And as this was a claim for direct sex discrimination, um, the respondent was not able to argue that the discrimination could be justified. Um, because as Al referred to earlier, other than for age discrimination, direct discrimination um, can never be justified. Uh, next slide, please, Ellie. So what do we learn from the case? Well, sometimes due to factors beyond an employer's control, um, it may not be possible to offer exactly the same facilities to both men and women, or to make um, the same arrangements in, in other areas, such as dress code, for example. Um, but this case does not say that employers must um, overcome physical limitations for building or with policies and procedures that offer identical facilities. And as a result, cases like this do turn a bit on their own facts. But in this case, the tribunal, the employment tribunal and the tribunal emphasised that the unsatisfactory arrangements put in place um, by the respondent um, were just not acceptable. You know, they, there was, um, you know, they were not sufficient for the needs and that was a discriminatory thing to do. And they really focused quite a lot on the relatively easy steps which could have been taken by the respondent to mitigate the, the situation and manage it. They could, for example, have fitted a lock to the main toilet door for the men's toilets so that the risk of men and women seeing each other in the toilets and women having to walk past the urinals could have been mitigated. Um, likewise, they could have just put a sanitary bin in the male toilets much more promptly so that they mitigated some of the practical difficulties that the claimants suffered. And they did point out that had the respondent taken such proactive action, this could in itself have been enough to defeat the claim because the toilet needs would then have been considered sufficient for the um, female members of staff needs. Okay, so that's the end of the case update. Um, Alison, back to you. We've got a couple of questions which we'll come to in a moment. Yeah, thanks for that. <clears throat> before we um, before we look at the um, the questions, we are um, we just wanted to highlight a couple of. Um, products that we have um, that we've developed um, within the employment team. So the first one is a um, an online HR and employment law for line managers course. So I think sometimes some of our managers might not feel necessarily skilled with covering some of the things that they might need to do when you're looking at um, um, employment issues. So this um, e-learning e course that we have um, covering key le legal areas, covers things like conducting a disciplinary, carrying out an investigation, all the way through to uh, other, other issues um, such as right to work checks, how to manage absent, uh, sickness, absence. So, um, so that's a great um, sort of um, short, short uh, uh, learning modules. Um, Ellie, if you'd like to move on to the next one, we also have a um, bite-sized online training um, on EDI, so equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, this is coming soon. Um, it's looking at anti-harassment and bullying in the workplace, unconscious bias, 
uh, leading uh, has lead equality and diversity um, and inclusion. Um, if these products are uh, are something that you're interested with, please do participate in our poll, and that will give us an idea as to um, whether this is something of interest to you. That would be great. Thank you. So we have. Um, we have three questions and one nice comment, which is great. <laughs> um, Cathy, which one do you want me to take the first one? I think so. Yes, I'll do them in order. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I know the uh, um, the delegate has posted this, so thanks for that. Um, my view is that if they have, if the if the post is considered suitable, if you've gone through the it's uh, objectively a suitable post and it's subjectively a suitable post for that individual, um, then I think what you're doing, which is um, not making them technically redundant because they're not, um, you, you have, um, you can withhold the redundancy payment. So I've probably done that the wrong way around. Probably what I should have done is read out the question. Kathy is nodding. Yes, that's what you should have done. So, so the, the, question, the question is, we have recently deleted a post and made the employee an offer a suitable alternative employment. They've rejected the alternative post. Our usual process would be that they are then technically redundant. They were over 55. We have not in the past then given them the enhancement early release of the pension. Do you think that the person should be entitled to the early and enhanced release of their pension? And, and as I said, not very um, uh, eloquently, is if you've gone through the process of looking to see that the offer of alternative employment is suitable, and that's an objective test and then a subjective test, then um, I, I, they're not technically redundant. So I think you're, you should be comfortable um, with that approach. Cathy, do you agree? Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Ooh. I'm not so familiar with the LGPS because um, <clears throat> suitable alternative employment, it, it means they don't get their redundancy payment. Oh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm not an LGPS expert. <laughs> I will take this offline with you, um, <clears throat> yeah. with the delegate. You know who you are. And uh, we'll have a little we'll have a little conflab later. Um, That's a really about, interesting. About that. It is an interesting case. It yeah. is. Yeah, I think um, it's a big big decision to, to take on the back of a of a chat <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely um so if i do the next one then yeah um the next one is oh rachel um are we still in the same place that enhancing maternity pay but not shared parental leave is still safe or have there been any further cases first thing i would say is nothing is ever safe in this area um but as far as i'm aware there's been nothing that's overturned the decision that actually you can still have different enhancements for shared parental leave, provided they provide the same benefits to both men and women on shared parental leave, then um, you don't need to enhance shared parental pay to the same extent as you do your shared maternity pay. Al, do you agree with that? I do, I do. That was easy, wasn't it? <laughs> um, okay, so then um, there's a question on flexible working. I'll just read that out. With regards to flexible working case, how do you safeguard against an employee submitting a claim even after the organisation still um, resorted to the first request? I think that means agreed, agreed to the first request. Um, I think the answer to that is you can't really, um, but that doesn't mean to say that you, I mean, the only way that you could do that is enter into a settlement agreement with them, which obviously waives their right to bring a claim um, in relation to that uh, flexible working request. But I think what you need to do is be confident in the original decisions that you're making and that you've considered the discriminatory, potential discriminatory effect of any uh, of any decision that you've made. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to agree to anything that the employee requests, but, um, but you need to be able to think through carefully and justify your decision and challenge your decision. I think that's sometimes some of the work that we do with our clients where they say well, there's absolutely no way we can agree to that and you know when you challenge it slightly and and push and probe it a bit then there, there is usually um something that you can do um and consider considering the discriminatory effects of that so not quite the answer but i, I hope that's helpful 
And the next case is in relation to the McQueen case. So if the unacceptable conduct had been attributable to the disability, could the employer have objectively justified disciplinary action if it had been put in place all reasonable adjustments to try and manage the situation and these had not been effective? Really good question, I think. Um, and, and I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, the purpose of reasonable adjustments is to support an employee to deliver in their role. And I think, you know, that there are two ways you can manage um, a, an individual with um, a disability where their conduct or their performance is not acceptable. One is by, you know, putting in place reasonable adjustments to support them where it arises from the, the disability. And the second is, as, as it was in the McQueen case, to identify that actually the behaviours are nothing to do with their disability. Um, and um, if you have sufficient evidence to, to manage it. But, but yes, you know, you should be able to proactively manage your um, employees to, to the, the point where they're performing adequately and behaving appropriately. Are you doing the next one, um, Alison? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start it, Cathy, and then I think you might want to uh, add, shall we say. So the next one is... Um, about equality law and how it impacts um, worker or status. So the question is how the equality law impacts the thin line difference between worker and employee status. There has been always debate about how courts define worker and employees and Uber is a massive example, but thus equality law has been able to justify this area. For me, um, what the Uber case did, just, just for those of you who uh, may not um, be aware of this. Uber looked at whether Uber drivers um, were um, capable of being workers under the relevant legislation, and particularly in relation to whether that meant that they could benefit from things like holiday pay uh, and other um, benefits and policies operated by um, Uber. Um, or whether they were genuinely self-employed. And, and there is also a difference between, obviously, between an employee uh, and a worker. Well, no, I'm not going to go into the, um, into the detail of that right now. But workers are protected under equality legislation. Um, and so to the extent that an individual has been harassed because of protect, protected characteristic or discriminated against because of a protected debt characteristic, irrespective of the fact that they're a worker or an employee, they still have that protection. The difference really is around um, the statutory rights that an employee enjoys, um, like the, the, for example, the right not to be unfairly dismissed that a worker won't have. And, and those, are, those are the differences, but that is a whole webinar all by itself just there. So um, thank you for the question. I hope to an extent that's answered it. Yes, I, I think the key point is that the workers have the same protection in relation to discrimination, isn't it, than, than employees. Yeah. Right, the next one, uh, both two more on flexible working. If an employee were to accept a flexible working request for an employee with a disability, um, e.g. being home-based full-time rather than attending the office, according to hybrid working pattern, which employees um, do, would the employer then have to accept any or all other similar requests from employees without a disability on the basis that the employee with a disability had proven that they could do their job full time from home? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I I'll start and then Al can chip in. Um, I suppose it's the extent to which um, a flexible working request sets a precedent, isn't it? So if if um, I ask to have Fridays off here at VWV and I can be accommodated and then I'll ask for Fridays as well and we service the same clients, whereas my flexible working request might be uh, accommodated, ours might not be. So to that extent, the consistency argument doesn't always work. You're looking at the um, individual circumstances the service, the impact on colleagues, all of the reasons why you can reject, reject a flexible working request. In, in practice, however, um, once you have agreed that a job can be performed adequately from home, it does give you an extra burden, an extra sort of layer of, of, of reasoning to, to get over um, to refuse somebody. 
Um, but uh, we're seeing a lot of employers at the moment who are saying, well, actually, they want people back in the office or in the in the workplace for two or three days for cultural reasons, to accommodate it for management, for learning, to you know, assist juniors, you know, all of those sorts of reasons. So I, I think you're not necessarily caught into saying because one person has done it, everyone else can automatically do it. You need to assess each situation on its own merits, taking into account the other working patterns there are around that person, the team, the role, um, but just be very clear in your reasoning. Um, you know, Al said earlier that flexible working requests rarely go to appeal, but what we do see are a lot of sex discrimination claims mm. where flexible working requests have been refused. Mm. Oh, I think, yeah, I mean, just to add to that, that does there that you often hear our um, sort of queries from clients where they say we've just reached saturation point, we just can't, we can't accommodate anymore. And, and those sorts of, um, those sorts of comments or those sorts of arguments can be justified. But again, you really need to test yourself and, um, and really challenge some of those, um, some of those views. It's not to say that they're not um, valid because because often they are we've got another um, flexible working question in the next question um, and Deborah asks if a person applies for flexible work working coming back from maternity leave do we have to accept the request even if we are not able to offer flexible working in a particular position or would we be discriminating by not accepting the request is um, <clears throat> no and possibly not um, you, under the flexible working regime, there are a number of um, reasons that you're permitted to give for not accepting a, um, a flexible working request. And one of them is the demands of the business. So if it, if it is the case that um, you that role really, really cannot be done on a flexible basis or part time uh, and you're able to show that, um, then you would be permitted um, to refuse that um request there, there's always a possibility that that employee will come back and challenge it um which is why you need to have really thought through um why it is that that role can't be done flexibly and and the rationale for that and again i think often it's about explaining it to the employee so that they understand it sometimes we do see um we do see responses that are just no I'm not going to do it we, we can't accommodate that without getting the employee to understand why, why that is. I don't know if you want to add any more to that. Catherine. No, and I think I think we're now at 10 o'clock. There was one question just on holiday pay, which is random, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but just to say, generally it's a two year yeah. backstop. So um, yes, that, that, that will be your starting point in negotiating it. There are certain exceptions to that, which are too complicated to go into now. <laughs> Um, so I would try and negotiate on the basis of two year back pay and then um, and, and, and then see where you get to. And if you don't reach agreement, then take some advice would be my advice. <laughs> OK, well, thank you all for your time. Um, we're going to draw it to a, to a close now. So um, um, we hope to see you at our next seminar.